evening and welcome to the Granada Forum. Tonight we are pleased to present Michael J. McNulty as our guest speaker. He is Director of COPS, Citizens Organized for Public Safety, a national public safety interest group concerned with law enforcement and citizen interface in the furtherance of the public good. It was in that capacity he began an extensive investigation into the events that occurred between February the 28th and April the 19th, 1993 in Waco, Texas. This examination of the Waco tragedy ultimately evolved into the making of two powerful feature-length documentary films, Waco, The Rules of Engagement, a Fifth Estate production, and Waco, A New Revelation, an MGA Films production. Clips of the later and more recent film will be shown during Mr. McNulty's presentation tonight. As a researcher and executive producer, he is in a unique position to tell the Waco story. The video film, Waco, A New Revelation, will be available for purchase at the conclusion of the program. It has created a firestorm, exposing new evidence, contradicting the FBI's official records about pyrotechnic devices found in the rubble at Mount Carmel. It further reveals shocking new revelations about the chain of command that ultimately allowed the brutal military operation to ensue. Narrated by former FBI Special Agent Frederick Whitehurst, it has triggered a new congressional investigation with related hearings presently underway. We think that you will find this a most enlightening presentation. Now, without further delay, join me in a nice warm welcome for Mr. Michael J. McNulty. If I seem a little fuzzy around the edges, that's because I am. I am really tired. Some, some bunch of redneck right-wing crazies kept me up all night. <laughs> right, well, do we have any of those here tonight? No? No, they, these are all polite, liberal ladies and gentlemen, right? I want you to look around and see the empty seats next to you. As far as I'm concerned, you're the choir. And the reason I'm here tonight is to help you to go out and help recruit new members to the choir. The choir is not Republican. The choir is not Democrat. The choir should not be conservative and exclusive of liberal. You see, what happened at Waco is not about right or left. It's about right or wrong. And until these seats are occupied by your more liberal friends and neighbors, you will fail at communicating your concerns. And that's the lesson that I learned the hard way in trying to tell this story uh, to people who should have listened but didn't listen. And even when they do listen, they don't get the message completely, vis-a-vis uh, -vis my friend Dan Rather. I'm going to just sort of ramble here for a few minutes while I get my brains focused in one direction. Uh, probably the, the most thrilling thing that's happened to me since making this series of, well, it's a series because there's at least two now, so I can call it a series, but uh, this series of films about this subject matter, and there's precious little that does thrill when one looks at the subject matter that we're talking about tonight. I was in the midst of uh, a bit of a whirlwind where we were getting two and 300 phone calls a day from the media about what is all this stuff back in August and September. We were pulling our hair out because we didn't have the film ready to turn out. It seems for some reason uh, the editing computer, uh, an Avid 8000, had a, developed a bad case of attitude and uh, determined that it would not capital emphasize, would not spit out the uh, final version of the film onto a master for dubbing. And what we found out later was we had made a, a major mistake by connecting that computer to the internet. And have you ever seen a computer turn itself on and go on the web by itself? I hadn't either up until that point. Um, anybody here familiar with the concept of uh, uh, PC Anywhere? You know what that is? Yeah. That's so your, your computer nerd can fix your computer from where he's at? Yeah. 
He can access your computer and do all kinds of wonderful things to it over the phone lines. Really? <laughs> over the phone lines. You mean that phone line plugged into the back of our Avid 8000? Yeah, that phone line. Seems we picked up a little virus, amongst other things. We uh, have had a lot of interesting experiences, that none of which relate to conspiracy theories, folks. I want you to understand something. I'm going to be very blunt with you. It's time to grow up, OK? It's time to go beyond conspiracy theories and go to factually based information that you weren't supposed to get, which, if you try to get, is referred to as a conspiracy theory. OK? Well, you've always known that that's a bunch of crap. Now it's time for you to find it out figure it out and do it. You're going, and this process is going to be painful, all right? You're going to have to release some of your pet theories, unless you can come up with the goods, to move on. To be an effective choir, you're going to have to be credible. And that's what I'm here for tonight, is to help you to become credible. Now, a lot of you think, what's he talking about? I'm credible. <sighs> well, if you were, all the rest of the seats would be full now, okay? The problem that we have collectively, and I'm speaking of myself as well, is that we go in areas where people fear to tread. You used to be able to go to Washington, D.C. and stand in an elevator in one of the house office buildings and he'll hear the most marvelous ribald jokes about government and politics. You don't hear them anymore. Not only do you not hear them anymore, but if someone dares to tell one, no one laughs, even when it's funny. Why? Well, I'm a bit of a student of history. My belief is, is that Dr. Santana is absolutely right, that if we don't learn from history, we'll be condemned to repeat it over and over again, sort of like a bad Hindu dream, reincarnated into the same crap all over again. My belief personally and historically is that we're locked into two continuous time frames that replicate two periods of history that are about to collide, and they're rather interesting. One is from 1770 to 1778 or 80 in this country. When you think about that, that was a glorious time. Produced, brought forth a lot of great people, people like Thomas Jefferson, my personal hero. Franklin, George Washington, Sam Adams, a number of people. But you know, it also brought forth King George III. Uh, another period of history that we seem to be running on parallel skirts with is the time frame of 1930 to 1940 in Central Europe, a place called Germany. And with that, I would simply remind you of the jokeless elevators in the House office building. People are afraid. you be afraid of your government? Are there reasons? Are you, or are you just paranoid? Okay. Yeah, you, you, you don't have to be paranoid to have people coming after you. Uh, we're going to see some stuff tonight. I hope it will elevate your consciousness, as the liberals are fond of saying. And if it doesn't, I'm going to want to know why. But what it's going to do is, is it, it should, I hope as it has with audiences that I've been in front of for the past three days, will first quiet you to the point to where you're not like a bunch of cats trying to be herded down the street. And you understand that what you're seeing is real. It's not somebody's conspiracy theory. It's not a Xerox of a bad picture that somebody found in a dumpster somewhere. The majority of this footage was made by the Texas Rangers they made it beginning the morning of April the 19th. And that is the majority of the footage in the film that we made. That footage was made unbeknownst, for the most part, to the FBI. Oops. There's a lot of oopses going on here. Uh, something I discovered in reviewing film from CBS News in 1993 and 94, in an effort to either prove or debunk a certain flamethrower tank person by the name of Linda Thompson. 
I was trying to find out, hey, you know, was that a flamethrower? You know, it could have been a jury rig propane gas jet like you see on uh, road graders, that kind of thing, because I knew for certain from my own personal experience in Vietnam for three tours of duty that it was not a flame flamethrower, as in on a tracked vehicle with a flamethrower mounted in the turret. And it turned out, no, it was not a flamethrower. But in the process of doing that and debunking Linda Thompson and making an enemy for the rest of my life, I found out something else. Watching this footage that CBS was very happy to provide me because they were scared to death of Linda Thompson and they wanted to see that issue resolved, I found that the camera, after watching the vehicle at the front doors and at the center of the building, Every time the tank would stop, the cameraman got antsy and he decided he would pan the entire building and you could look off towards the north end and see a bit of the back of the building. And over a period of a couple of hours, something was bothering me. I couldn't figure out what it was. And I asked the editor who was working with me to peg, like elapsed time, all of the hard left pans. He would sit for five seconds and then pan back all those five second increments, put them all together. Lo and behold, what we saw was a herky-jerky collapse of the back of the structure. What the heck was that? The back of the building disappeared. It was a big cloud of dust. What was that? Well, I'd been a commercial insurance broker for almost 20 years and had a few occasions of being involved with the demolition of wood frame buildings and knew that if you demolished a building, you had to be careful and remove all the metal strapping, pipe, et cetera, out of the building first in a wood frame structure so that when you did knock it down, it didn't cause sparks and cause the, the, the wood rubble to catch on fire. You had to be careful about the exhaust system on the vehicle that you used to do the demolition because it, too, could ignite a fire. So I reasoned. That's an important word, folks. We all need to start reasoning instead of rationalizing. Okay? We need to start asking hard questions. Well, okay, that's interesting information, but. And then if you can't figure it out, don't throw it away. Put it on a shelf that says, I'll think about this later. Okay? That's a process we all need to. It's called critical thinking, and it's a thing that we all need to practice more frequently so we don't get sucked into Linda Thompson's garbage. Okay? That probably did more damage to the concept of people understanding Waco than any one thing possibly could have. And the fellow sitting right here in the front row is responsible for that. Neil Shulman brought me that tape when he first got it. And, oh, he was excited. I remember that day. He came running into the office, driving all the way in from Santa Monica out to Corona. you got to see this. Well, Neil and I worked on it for a while, and a number of other people worked on it for a while, and came to these conclusions. But the, the conclusion I'm trying to get to is, is that the building collapsed. How did the building collapse? Could that have been involved in the start of the fire? Could that have caused the start of the fire? And then subset theories developed out of that of, well, perhaps they knocked over a lantern because there had been several lanterns used to light the interior of the building because the electricity was turned off. And we went through all this rigmarole. What you're going to see some clips of tonight is sort of the culmination of, what, Neil, seven years? Seven years in May. Seven years in May of dedicated pursuit. I want you to understand it has its limitations, okay? This is not something you can show a jury and expect them to deduce a conviction. It isn't. But it is something that Mr. Danforth finds very interesting. And he's prosecutor. There's things we couldn't put in the film because it crossed the line into prosecutorial territory. You don't want to do that if you're a filmmaker. It's not my job. But Passing it on to Mr. Danforth is my job. Watching Mr. Danforth and making sure that he does what he ought to with it is my job. And if he doesn't, making sure that others who have the end of that long rope called Waco in their hands, they wear white Stetsons and cowboy boots. They talk sort of funny. And they're probably the greatest bunch of guys I've ever met in law enforcement, and I've met me a few, called Texas Rangers. I'll thank them for you. Uh, they have deferred to Mr. Danforth's investigation, which is appropriate in my opinion. Uh, I'll be meeting with Mr. Danforth, his representatives, his staff people, chief staff people, Ed Dowd and uh, uh, Mr. Schweik, 
next week to finish a process that started in December, hopefully. Uh, the information that they're getting, they're using. And the good news is they're being proactive about it, ladies and gentlemen. That, that should convince you at this point that they are doing what they're supposed to do. The final step is going to be, will they take the information that they develop and seek appropriate prosecution and indictments? We'll see. The issue of evidence is key. That's why we went to the evidence locker in Austin. That's why we pressed as hard as we did. We got lucky, and by the grace of God, we got to go in, not once, but four times. The young gentleman who you'll see briefly standing on the left side, I'll be on the far right, and the gentleman in between is a Texas Ranger by the name of Jim Miller, standing in the evidence locker looking at materials. Uh, his name is Bill Johnston. Now, Mr. Johnston is suffering from a terminal disease. It's called integrity. And uh, it's anathema at the Justice Department, and he knows it. That's why he resigned last week after 12 years as a prosecutor with a 99% effective prosecution rate. If I were the relative of a homicide victim, uh, the fella I would want to have prosecute the case is Bill Johnston. He's a straight arrow. That's his problem. He has that disease, integrity, and, and he has this nasty habit of always telling the truth. Now, he pursued the prosecution of the Branch Davidians in 1993. Okay, so the man's had a wee bit of an epiphany. And uh, for you, those of you that are not aware of what that word means, which I wasn't, I had to go look it up. Somebody gave him a come to Jesus speech, and he followed. He did. And he saw the light. What it was was showing him some documents that came out of the hard work of a man named David Hardy, who I love and admire. He's an attorney in Tucson, Arizona, who assisted us greatly with this investigation. And he managed somehow to convince a judge to give him a number of documents, some of which you'll see, one of which you'll see tonight, out of the files of an organization known as the Combat Applications Group of Fort Bragg, North Carolina, more popularly known to you as Delta Force. And documents that spell out what they were up to, what they did. Probably most interesting than Mr. Johnston, notes to the file preserved by JAG officers, the military's lawyers for that unit, that talked about him and the fact that the line officers shouldn't be doing what they were doing. They had been warned, and then they had been advised to contact Mr. Johnston and secure his assistance uh, in dealing with what they were about to engage in so that he could, quote, cover their ass, unquote. They refused to do that. They got into an argument with the attorneys and threatened to have them court-martialed for disobedience, disobedience with direct order. <sighs> Fortunately, they were smart enough to document the file. We got the documents, showed them to Bill Johnson. Bill Johnson took a deep breath and said, you know, I never knew those guys were there. But it talks about the necessity of warning Mr. Johnson so that he could be enlisted to protect them. He found that pretty odd. Then he found other things, and as we went into the evidence locker and looked at the evidence, he found more things that were disturbing. Pyrotechnic devices that the government said weren't there were there. Other devices that were supposed to be in the evidence chain and there were photographs of were not in the evidence chain. They were missing. Of course, there's a long series of missing pieces of evidence in this case. But Mr. Johnson got very concerned and very upset. He also started digging into his own records and found other evidence that he shared with the Attorney General in the hopes that perhaps she had been misled by her own people. Uh, I've got an opinion about that, but that's okay. We'll share that later. The upshot is, is that we now have not quite what was stated in the address introducing me. We have two congressional investigations, one in the House and one in the Senate. The one in the House led by Congressman Dan Burton and his committee the one in the Senate led by uh, Senators uh, Grassley and Specter. Uh, and one of the gentlemen you'll see tonight in these clips, Mr. Gene Cullen, uh, a former uh, Director of Security for Special Operations Group at the CIA, uh, is now under Mr. Grassley's protection. 
because the CIA and the FBI had threatened him with a long prison term for violating his security agreement. Their contention is, doesn't matter if you saw us break the law, you can't talk about it. Mr. Grassley's opinion is, if you broke the law and he doesn't talk about it, he'll be held as an accomplice. How'd you like to be in that vice? Now they threaten his child and they threaten him and right now he's in the, uh, the equivalent of the Witness Protection Act. He's protected. Uh, it's taken a lot of courage for a lot of these people to come forward. We have FBI agents, Texas Ranger senior captains who conducted investigations, Branch Davidians who saw very little of what really happened. Very little. They were too busy trying to put out their shorts as they were exiting the building, things like that. Uh, there's other individuals here that are interesting. Uh, experts, uh, Colonel uh, Jack Frost, an ordinance expert who you'll see, and uh, Ramsey Clark, former U.S. Attorney General, who by anyone's account is liberal. Uh, General Ben Parton, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with. But we have others, too. We have Gene Cullen, the former Director of Security of the Special Operations Group of the CIA. We have uh, Mr. Stephen Berry, a former Special Forces operator. He was a trainer. He is a very highly skilled sniper who trained a number of the individuals that are snipers on Delta Force's team. Understand, Delta Force Combat Applications Group, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, is a combined force element. You'll have SEALs, you'll have Air Force Commandos, you'll have Marine Force Recon, you'll have Army Rangers, you'll have a number of individuals participating in this organization. You're going to see some of them tonight. Keep a close eye on the passengers as they disembark from the C-130 that you're going to be seeing, Coast Guard C-130 I might add, landing at the small airport near Mount Carmel. Keep an eye as you see the camera pass across a group of men standing in green Nomex flight suits wearing black tactical web gear with some odd equipment on their back. Pay attention to that equipment. It bespeaks of premeditation relative to the fire. This film has more information and detail in it than the first film could even contemplate. And we want to encourage people to both get it. The reason we chose to release it as a home video was so that you, the people, could get it into your hands, have it, and deal with it, rather than having to just go to the theater like we did with the first one and see it, and that was it for a while. Uh, the idea is to get the information passed to people so that they can understand. The biggest complaint about the new film is, God, i got to watch it again. I missed that. A little under two hours. Uh, we had hoped that that would be the reaction. The director, uh, Jason Van Vliet, did a great job. This sucker flies by in 110 minutes. The little pieces that you'll see tonight, first of all, it's projected. It's not going to look quite as good as it really does when you watch it on the TV screen. But this, the imagery in this film is of much greater quality than the first film. The first film was a collection of multi-generational pieces of video that we'd acquired from here and there. This stuff is first generation material, a lot of which the uh, Texas Rangers themselves had shot, so on and so forth, in our interviews. This time we had a whole bunch of FBI agents that came forward. <coughs> Excuse me. In addition, the Texas Rangers came forward in the film. Uh, the chairperson of the jury, Sarah Baines, came forward. A number of folks that we hadn't heard from before have come forward. The, the majority of this film you have not seen before. So it's all going to be new. Uh, do we have any young youngsters in the audience tonight? I didn't see any. <laughs> ah, no, he's not young. He's old enough. We won't do that to you, son. Reach over there and smack your dad on the head for me. Anyway, the point is, there is one scene in here that's a little bit much to take. If you've got a squeamish stomach, you don't want to see it. We're going to take you inside the bunker, so-called, and show you the results of what a high-explosive detonation does to a human body 
in the form of a nine-month pregnant female and what she looks like after that detonation occurred. That detonation was brought about by a device that was placed on the roof by the government during the course of the demolition. Uh, I wished I hadn't found out what I found out. I wished Ephraim Zimblis Jr. was still the ideal in my mind of what the FBI is, but unfortunately it is not. That's sad. Each of you needs to remember that the people that were there at Waco were not all evil. There were certainly some that were. Many of them felt they were doing their job. But more importantly, they all were there. The good, the bad, and the ugly were there representing you and I. They were our federal law enforcement representatives. Their behavior reflects directly on us. If we do not react and respond in an appropriate fashion, if any of you have the ideas of Timothy McVeigh, I don't want to hear about it. Tim McVeigh saw what happened at Waco. He was there during the 51-day siege. I have videotape of him being interviewed by press people sitting on the roof of his car with Waco, Mount Carmel, in the background. What he did was a heinous act, a criminal act, an insane act, a stupid act, of blowing up a building full of innocent people. Uh, don't, don't go there. Hell yes, he did. Did he do it by himself? Hell no, he didn't. But that's, you know, here we go, okay, guys? Conspiracy theories are only good if they can be deduced to factual information. A theory, a theory is designed to evolve into fact. If it doesn't, let it go. Well, of course not. He wasn't alone because the government can't explain who the other people were who were with him because some of them happened to be affiliated with the government. No, 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 no. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, folks, because this is it, all right? I worked on Timothy McVeigh's defense team for half a year. And the reason I did was for this reason. I believe that Mr. McVeigh, after looking at the evidence, was guilty of the act of being involved in it, but I also believed he wasn't the only one. But I also believed that he shouldn't be given the death penalty, he should be allowed to stay in prison for the rest of his natural life and think about and deprive him of being the martyr that he wants to be. How many of you have talked to Tim McVeigh? Okay. I'm sorry? No, 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 no. Come on, guys. Sir, can you save it until I finish my presentation, please? Thank you. The point is, the popular myth around Tim McVeigh doesn't, isn't supported by the facts. But on the other hand, the representations by the federal government to the court of Judge Walter Mache aren't true either. So the fact is, we all have an obligation to find out what the truth is. So you have to work on it. Right? It's uh, real easy to form conceptions without fact. It's very tempting because it gives you what you want most. You want answers. I don't blame you for that, but I do hold you all responsible as individual citizens because, see, that's your job is to watch the bastards, okay, and to act responsibly. Running after Linda Thompson and flamethrower tanks is not acting responsibly, okay? I don't want anybody running after me on these films either. I want you to make up your own minds. That's why we built them the way we built them. We didn't draw conclusions. A lot of people do when they watch the films, but it's up here. You have to decide what you're seeing. The government tells you time and again that we didn't fire a single shot at the Branch Davidians. Well, Fred Whitehurst will address that subject tonight in the clips that I'm gonna, about to show you. But the issue becomes one of, goes back to the old Groucho Marx line. Remember Duck Soup? Remember when uh, the old lady caught him in the bed with the beautiful blonde and she comes in and starts giving him one of these? And he jumps out of bed and gives her one right back and says, who are you gonna believe, me or your lying eyes? <laughs> hey, the government wants you to believe that what you're seeing are solar reflections on pieces of glass that have amazing properties. 
Have you ever seen a piece of glass that could go from 72 degrees Fahrenheit to 12 or 1500 degrees Fahrenheit and then cool back down to 72 degrees Fahrenheit and do all this at a cyclic rate of 600 times a minute? <laughs> that's what thermal imaging is. It's measuring the temperatures of this object. And that's what the government wants you to believe. They say it over and over again. So my question is, are you going to believe me, the government, or are you going to believe your lying eyes? Well, we're about to find out, thanks to Mr. Danforth. He worked out a little resolution of a problem. You should be proud of it. This is what I mean. He's been proactive. He hasn't just sat around and asked a few questions. He went out and resolved a problem on how to resolve the bigger problem. Is that gunfire on the forward-looking infrared at the back of the building an hour before the fire started? And he forced the government's hand, of which they're not real happy. They're still squalling about it. They're still filing briefs with the, uh, with the court trying to get out of conducting this test that's going to be run on March the 15th or thereabouts at Fort Hood. Now, here's the kicker. People were asked if they saw the 60 Minutes 2 thing. You have to take this in small baby steps, folks, because having Dan Rather get up and have an expert on national television all due disrespect to Mr. Rather, but nevertheless get up in front of national television audience and say, here is a FLIR expert by the name of Paul Beaver from Jane's Military Analysts, highly respected organization. Let's see what he says about the gunfire. And Paul Beaver shows you what an M4 carbine looks like on a FLIR camera being discharged. And gosh, that sort of looks like those flashes on the infrared at Waco. Then he shows you the Waco footage and says, well, of course that's gunfire. It couldn't be anything else. And as a matter of fact, Mr. Beaver is the fellow that helped the British government to develop a technique using FLIR to identify the location of snipers by muzzle flashes appearing on the infrared tape. And did so quite effectively in Northern Ireland. Now the point is, rather put it up. You can't take that away from him. Now, you don't have to give him a National Emmy for it, but I already did that. I got to tell you that story and then we'll show you the clips and get on with this. Uh, August to September, things heated up with this whole story about Waco. And lo and behold, I got a chance to go on Nightline, the vaunted Nightline and Ted Koppel. Whoa, big time. I didn't behave very well. You would have been proud of me. <laughs> Went on the show, Chris Bury, their talking head who does the setup pieces, started showing Linda Thompson flamethrower tank footage and throwing all this crap around about conspiracy theorists. And you know, <clears throat> the government says, the conspiracy theorists are saying, and painting this picture. And then he turns it over to Koppel, and Koppel says, and now we'd like to introduce you to Mike McNulty, a conspiracy theorist who got lucky. <laughs> Uh-oh, you should not have said that, Ted. Now, I'll tell you the punchline first. The show didn't air. We taped it four hours before it was supposed to air, but it didn't air. So here's why. This dumb yuckhead McNulty interrupts the host. That? And he said, now, Mr. Koppel, I, I'm going to have to take issue with this, because you see, me and my, key, my, my colleagues and I, we see ourselves not as conspiracy theorists, but investigative journalists. And to that end, you know, we've, we've gotten an Academy Award nomination for Best Documentary Film of the Year. We've gotten uh, the Film of the Year, Feature Film of the Year, Documentary Film of the Year Award from the International Documentary Association. And by the way, Mr. Koppel, next week, first week of September, you and I are going head-to-head -head for a national Emmy for best investigative journalism. Oh, <coughs> well, good luck. Good luck to you too, sir. A week later, Ted went home without the Emmy. I went home with it. Now, what the hell does that mean? You know what it means? By the grace of God, I got lucky. Because somebody finally sat down and watched what the heck we did. 
And what we did appeared on HBO. It got legitimized, okay, to a degree. Probably a little more than what I'm comfortable with, but that's okay. It got legitimized to the degree that the seats that are empty in the audience tonight might have a better chance of being filled. That's all that means. It doesn't mean that Mike McNulty is a great guy. It doesn't mean that the film is a great film. Actually, the HBO version that won the Emmy pff, sucked. The, the darn original film was almost three hours long. They cut it down to 68 minutes. Come on. That's like trying to describe a cow by giving you a pot roast. I mean, there's a lot of blood in the pot roast, but I mean, you know, it just didn't do it for me. But apparently, just that much impressed people that voted and made the decision and gave the Emmy and yada, yada, yada. Okay, that's cool. Uh, but likewise, in the same vein, Waco, A New Revelation was submitted to Sundance Film Festival, just like the first film was, and it was rejected. You ought to see some of the films that were accepted. But it was rejected with no explanation. Some of the behind the scenes explanations ran like this. Well, you see, that would have been the third Waco film submitted to the festival. Well, I know what the first one was. That was Waco, The Rules of Engagement. What the heck was the second one? Well, you see, David Thibodeau submitted a compilation of footage from Waco and called it a video film and, you know, and oh, okay. You know, I'll do respect to David. It was just a collection of some video footage. But I think really what bothered them was a clip that we're not going to see tonight, unfortunately. I thought it was in there. It has to do with the chain of command. I'm going to tell you this, and then we'll watch the clips. Okay, chain of command. Who made, you, everybody understands, somebody made a decision to do what was done there, right? It wasn't our friend Dick Rogers, the butler, as we call him. And when you see the film, you'll see what I mean. Uh, who made the decision on the ground to take the tanks into the building, demolish the building, and engage in a gunfight with the Branch Davidians. He didn't make that decision. And it wasn't uh, the other players on the ground. It wasn't uh, Larry Potts. It wasn't Danny Colson. And it wasn't Michael Kehoe. And it wasn't, it wasn't even Floyd Clark back in the command center, excuse me, in Washington, D.C. Oh, boy. Not only these two people. <clears throat> well, not actually. Three. How the Delta Force people got there was not by accident. The law is very clear. Someone has to sign off for their participation. Even their mere presence has to be signed for. There are two legal authorities that can sign off on that issue. President of the United States, uh -uh, uh -uh. Secretary of Defense, Les Aspen. Yeah, Les, Les Aspen's dead. <laughs> oh, that bill, he gets around, doesn't he? Well, I can get away with that here. I can't do that at the, at the Democratic Women's Club next week. Uh, there was, a, there was a newspaper article in uh, a New York publication came out last week. Uh, I did an interview with them the weekend before. It's called the New York Press. They've got about a quarter million circulation, mostly on the island of Manhattan. Uh, it's sort of a counter to the village voice. Uh, weird newspaper. But nevertheless, they ran this front page story on their interview with me, and uh, I don't think Hillary's going to like it. It's... Uh, one of the most god-awful pictures you've ever seen of Hillary, and there's some bad ones out there. Um, taken off of a TV set, and the, the headline next to it says, Hillary's Holocaust? Question mark? And below that it says, is Waco Investigator onto something, or is he really off his rocker? <laughs> nope, I'm still on it. Well, it was an interesting article. It ran a full newspaper size page without advertising and another picture of Hillary that I, I don't know where they find these things. They sent six copies over to Hillary's headquarters along with a copy of the tape. Um, I don't know what they're up to, but they're having fun, so I guess that's all that counts. Somebody sent some copies over to Rudy Giuliani's office too. 
And the reason is because you see this chain of command is followed in the film. And you know who told us about it? We didn't know about it. Texas Rangers told us about it. They said, you know, we had this problem. The FBI was sort of squeezing us. They talk like that, squeezing us. And uh, we couldn't get our investigation done. So we needed some help. Boy, the seats are filling in. That's cool. Any of you folks liberal? No? Oh, OK. Um, and so they had a problem. Okay, the FBI wouldn't let them look at uh, FBI 302 reports, which basically are documents that the uh, FBI uses their sworn statements, sort of like an after-action report. And uh, they wouldn't let them look at the, the issues revolving around uh, the death of the four ATF agents, which is what they were supposed to be investigating. They wouldn't let them look at ATF after-action shooting reports, things like this. So they were having a hard time doing this investigation that the assistant U.S. attorney, Mr. Johnston, had charged them with doing. So they went and saw their old friend, Commander-in-Chief of the Texas Law Enforcement Community, Ann Richards, Governor Ann Richards. Now, in case any of you missed her act at the Democratic Convention, you could say she's a Democrat. And you could say she's a friend of Bill's. Well, she gave them a recommendation on a person that he, they could contact. Um, they were a little surprised. Uh, this is an individual in Washington that they could contact and would straighten out the FBI. Straighten them out? Okay. So they went to the uh, next meeting with the FBI uh, leadership, uh, Floyd Clark and the others, and they started dropping this guy's name. All of a sudden, these guys just got so friendly, it was downright sickening. They couldn't figure it out. I don't think they ever did call him. Vincent Foster. Oh. Well, that's sort of, you know, I had the same reaction. <laughs> Vincent Foster? What are you talking about? So we sort of tracked that one down, authenticated it, and then started looking for more details. What we found was a chain of evidence that said the control of the situation shifted after Miss Reno left in mid-morning. We can see the effects of her leaving in the action seen in the videotape, photographs, etc. It got strange. Strange things began to happen. And more evidence has been coming out. New FLIR videotape has been recovered by the marvelous Janet Reno and the U.S. Marshals from the FBI at Quantico, Virginia. Things like this. And so we, we move on and what we see is, is this chain of evidence that says that Floyd Clark was basically trying to take Bill Sessions' job away from him in a quiet coup d'etat that was going on inside the FBI that's detailed with a letter from a Mr. Gerson, who was the acting attorney general, to a guy <coughs> named William Jefferson Clinton, advising him that he should not trust Mr. Sessions any longer. This was March the 11th. And that he should be considering these gentlemen as his replacement. And the first one on the list was Floyd Clark. Hey, anybody know where Floyd works now? You know, he didn't get directorship of the FBI. Got any ideas? Oh, he's the chief of security for the Revlon Corporation. <laughs> what he does is, you know those, those funny looking hands you see in the commercials for the new Revlon um, uh, fingernail polish? That's Floyd. <laughs> Seriously, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Mr. Perlman, who owns Revlon Corporation, big contributor to Mr. Clinton, also happens to be the resource that Vernon Jordan took Monica Lewinsky to go visit to try and get her a job to get her the hell out of the White House. Okay, And um, so it's curious that Mr. Clark would wind up not getting the directorship of the FBI, but he is the head of security of the Revlon Corporation. I don't know what that means. At any rate, um, we have the chain of command going through Floyd, and then it goes directly to the individual who took Miss Reno's place and responsibility when events went south at Waco that day by the name of Webster Hubble. Now, that's convicted felon Webster Hubble, former attorney, deputy attorney general. Two times, that's right. He's back. In prison, that is. Um, Mr. Hubble is a curious figure. You ought to read his biography. Read it carefully, particularly the part about April the 19th, particularly the part about 
his and others in the administration's Insiders Arkansas group lobbying Mr. Foster to not release a certain undisclosed bit of information about certain activities of the administration that they didn't want revealed. Uh, right up to the, the afternoon that he died, Marsha or Maggie, no, Marsha Scott, Marsha Scott uh, spent an hour and a half behind closed doors with him, apparently discussing these matters. Uh, Mr. Hubble doesn't identify the information, but then we go from there, okay, gosh, you know, sort of pointing to Vince Foster, maybe we ought to go look and see what Vince was up to. So we go to the Whitewater Senate hearings. Remember those? Not many people do. But let's go look and see what Vince Foster's secretary, Deborah Gorham, says. And let's go look and see what his staff intern, Mr. Thomas Castleton, had to say. Let's go see what the Secret Service agent, Harry O'Neill, saw on the night of July the 20th, late at night. What did he see coming out of Vince Foster's office? The documents that these other people testified to having seen were a letter about Waco that he was drafting the day that he died, a file marked Waco in his lockup next to his desk, and a manila envelope with the uh, sealed heavily with tape uh, with the name of attention and Attorney General Janet Reno, eyes only, marked on the outside of it, put in the national security safe that Mr. Foster had in Mr. Nesbaum's office. So here's these documents. We know they exist. They were seen by a number of individuals. We don't know what's in them. However, what we do know is Secret Service agent Harry O'Neill found a woman in the company of Bernie Nesbaum leaving Mr. Foster's office in the middle of the night as he was doing his rounds in the White House offices, carrying an armful, five to six inches thick, of documents and files. Her name was Maggie Williams. Maggie Williams is the chief of staff of the First Lady. Then we go to the Senate hearings. Now this is all documented in the Senate evidence, okay? I didn't dream this stuff up. I didn't even have to organize it. They did it. The Senate did it. Well, then we go from there to Thomas Castleton's testimony before the Senate on camera, and he's going to tell you, well, yeah, Miss Williams had us put all these documents in this cardboard box a few days after Vince's death and had me, she marched me up and carried them into the presidential private quarters and turned them over to Hillary Rodham Clinton. And why? Well, so Mrs. Clinton could review them. Now, understand, there's also a clip in there of a man named Kenneth Starr testifying before the, the House Judiciary Committee on the Impeachment, saying to it, the most egregious offense by the Clinton administration was the suppression and obstruction of justice in that suppression of documents from Vince Foster's office. You see, the FBI and the Park Police never acquired those documents. The last person known to have them was Hillary Rodham Clinton. So what I want you to do is I'll go home and make little campaign buttons. I want you to start wearing them. And they're going to say, Hillary, where's Vince's Waco records? I don't want to hear about the, the time records for uh, you know, the Rose Law Firm. They found those. But what about Vince's records on Waco? Oh, just to make it interesting, we did find the FBI's 302 report from the interview with Mr. Foster's wife, Lisa. Her comment was, there was all this stuff going on, it was horrible, all this pressure, Lanny Gineer failed nomination, da 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 but the thing that was really bothering Vince the most was the death of all the children at Waco and how he felt personally responsible, quote, unquote. We interview a man named Dennis Scolombrini. He is an FBI agent. You guys all remember Gary Aldridge, don't you? Okay, well, this is Gary Aldridge's partner, the one that never spoke. He speaks now. He had a relationship with Mr. Foster, and he makes some observations about all this, about the evidence, so on and so forth. And the question I have, Mr. Starr, why did you not prosecute the First Lady for obstruction of justice in the removal of those documents upon her orders and in her possession? Where are they? What do they mean? What was the role of the White House in Waco? And why didn't you prosecute this woman? I hate it when people ask questions like that. But that's okay. It's something Mr. Starr should answer. Uh, it's something Mrs. Clinton should answer. And hopefully, in the process of the elections in New York, she will.
One thing I've learned to do is to be a real pain in the ass. <laughs> Matter of fact, I was told the other day the FBI has nominated me for hemorrhoidectomy of the century. <laughs> but, <laughs> ooh, that was bad. That, that, that too shall pass, but you know, it's one of those kinds of things to where I think it's really time to start showing you some of these clips, and then we'll do some questions. I've rambled on. Boy, I did pretty good there. Uh, if we can start showing the clips, after each clip, I'll pause, give a little insight, and, whoa, you all right? After each clip, well, so much for that chair. Nope. After each clip, I'll give a little comment, and then we'll take questions about what you're seeing, okay? So if we can do the clips. This is a U.S. military Mark 651 CS projectile recovered in the aftermath of the Mount Carmel fire. It is pyrotechnic and has a burning time of 25 to 30 seconds. It generates a distinctive cloud of white smoke. I am very, very troubled by the information I received this week suggesting that pyrotechnic devices may have been used in the early morning hours on April the 19th, 1993 at Waco. At this time, all available indications are that the devices were not directed at the main wooden compound, were discharged several hours before the fire started, and were not the cause of the fire. In the fall of 1998, unprecedented access to the Waco evidence lockers was granted. The pyrotechnic projectiles identified in the crime scene photos were missing from the evidence boxes. However, two additional 40 millimeter munitions were found. These devices are identified by the manufacturer's literature as pyrotechnic rounds. They were found in the rubble behind the compound. These munitions were examined, and the preliminary results indicated these devices may have passed through the wood structure. fails to identify the specific instruments used to ignite the fires or the individuals that might have used those instruments. As a result, no arson charges were ever filed against any of the Branch Davidians. What is not covered in the arson report is the presence of the government's own pyrotechnic devices at the points of origin of the fire. This flashbang device, for example, was found in the rubble of the dining room. The flash that results as the detonation of this charge can cause a fire in any area where there is a high concentration of volatile vapors. In the evidence locker, there are six pyrotechnic flashbang grenades mislabeled as silencers or gun parts. According to the Texas Department of Public Safety, they were found in the southwest corner of the building, the dining room, and the chapel, all three points of origin of the fire. Can we have the lights, please? Thank you. Um, did you like the voice of the narrator? Uh, that happens to be Dr. Frederick Whitehurst. You'll see him a little bit later. Uh, there's a little story that goes with that that is fascinating. You see, while Fred was working at the FBI, they recognized that his voice was was very, very good for this kind of work. So it seems that Fred uh, did all the narration for all the FBI training films that went out to all the law enforcement agencies across the country for a number of years. He became known as the voice of the FBI. <laughs> so, well, that's sort of why we like the idea of Fred narrating the film. He felt strongly enough to do it. Uh, he also acted as a consultant on explosives residue and a number of other things. So. That's the story about Fred Whitehurst. Uh, the interesting story about the projectiles, uh, and in particular, the flashbang devices, and you remember the, the first one with the little red stripe around it? That's a M651, it's a US military CS gas round. 
Uh, funny thing about that, that footage of Janet uh, exhibiting her severe symptoms of Parkinson's disease, that's why the shaking, uh, she received a letter from us with the photograph of that projectile and other documentation about pyrotechnic devices being used at Waco, including the two uh, black and silver projectiles that we showed you. Uh, in a letter received by her on November 30th, 1998. Well, I don't know how many of you saw her press conferences, but she declared emphatically when it was first brought up that she had seen absolutely no new evidence of the use of pyrotechnic devices. And that was August the 26th, 1999. Now I know she's ill and I know she's not feeling well and I, I suspect they keep her in a small closet in the basement of the Justice Department, but gee, golly, gosh, and holy smokes, November 30th, 1998 to August the 26th, does she have Alzheimer's too? What's going on here? Okay, and that's, that's the question. I mean, why, why are these folks so busy about the business of denying that they did what they did? Does it? Well, then maybe the lady needs to be replaced because she's ill. I don't know. I guess the, the, the bottom line is not Janet Reno. The bottom line is the Justice Department, the FBI, oh, hello, my brakes just went off, the FBI, and the Defense Department were all given these multiple page letters with documents, videotapes, and photographs in the fall of 1998. And it wasn't until after the 26th of August that finally the government admitted that Delta Force actually was there. But we sent them the photographs and the videotape and I don't know. I guess it's up to you to decide what kind of credibility the United States government has these days. Well, you have to do something about it. And that doesn't include blowing up buildings, all right? Not. Let's look at the next clip. While Americans were watching events unfold at the front of the building, the FBI's infrared video shows what took place at the rear of the structure. What a FLIR really does is it takes uh, invisible radiation, which is called infrared radiation, and it converts it into visual radiation, you might say, that we can see with the eye. What we have here is a, a tank infantry type of an operation. As the tank moves forward, two men have dropped out of the escape hatch. Uh, they roll over, and as they roll over, they open up with automatic gunfire. We've measured the actual time of the individual flashes, and they occur at a fraction of a second, uh, in some cases, a thirtieth of a second. There is absolutely nothing in nature that can cause thermal flashes to occur in a thirtieth of a second. Somebody related or who had prepared a film or analyzed a film, representatives of the department and representatives of the FBI went over it in detail and concluded that there was no basis for suggesting the shot that shots had been fired. As the tank crushes the roof of the gymnasium, gunfire can be seen streaming into the dining room from positions in the courtyard. I stopped counting after about 62 individual shots. Events unfold at the front of the building. The FBI's infrared video shows what took place at the rear of the structure. What a flare really does. It... As the tank crushes the roof of the gymnasium, gunfire can be seen streaming into the dining room from positions in the courtyard. I What we have here is a, a tank infantry type of an operation. As the tank moves forward, two men have dropped out from positions in the courtyard. And as they roll over, they open up with automatic gunfire. We have There's absolutely nothing in nature that can cause thermal flashes to occur in a thirtieth of a second. federal judge in Waco and 
the attorneys and their experts from uh, representing the Branch Davidians and the federal attorneys. So we'll find out soon. So what if it is gunfire? What does it mean? Well, somebody had to be pulling the triggers. The guns didn't grow legs and walk to the back of the building and fire into the back of the building. There's a lot more information about FLIR. There's a lot more information about the other subjects that we touch on briefly here that is just as revealing about a number of other issues. So I hope that you'll get a copy of the film. Not because I just want to sell the copies of the film that we've got. I do want to do that. But more importantly, I want you to know what you're dealing with. I want you to be able to show the lying eyes of your friends and neighbors what you got. Okay? That's why we did it in home video first. It would have been much more appropriate to release it in theaters first and do the same route that we did last time. But we felt that the timing and the importance of this was to get it into your hands. So let's watch the next clip and find out who were these guys back there shooting? If someone comes to me to understand the data, I need to tell them the uncertainty associated with it. If the government is only telling them uh, this was not a field of fire, well, the government is refusing to look at this, and anybody with their plain eyes can see, well, something's going on there. You know, when you think of the fact they're shooting automatic weapons fire into a building with children in it, there's something wrong. Dr. Allard has stated that this video shows gunfire being directed into Mount Carmel from the outside of Mount Carmel on April 19th. The only people that could have come from would have been federal agents. Other flashes can be detected on the FLIR tape within an hour of the fire, such as this detonation in the courtyard which has a thermal signature that is consistent with a hand grenade exploding. And more gunfire can be seen near this tank. But if the FBI's claim is true, and the hostage rescue team didn't fire at Branch Davidians, then there is only one other possibility. According to what we saw written in the Book of Mayhem, we were to undergo a military-style attack. We were to be attacked by tanks and people from the military. On the use of military personnel and heavy equipment against U.S. citizens, other questions linger. How much was used and why? There was concern expressed that the FBI had only one hostage rescue team and, and they were tiring. What is generally known or, or known in public as, the, as Delta Force is in reality called Combat Applications Group. So anybody who asks about Delta will get told with a straight face by the Army that no such organization exists. What organization does exist is Combat Applications Group, and their stated mission is to perform counterterrorism operations overseas in defense of U.S. interests. executive staff meeting at CIA headquarters and it involved senior agency management along with uh, the liaison officers from the US military in particular from Delta group uh, the briefing centered on Delta's operations in Waco Texas This previously classified military document confirms the presence of Delta Force at Mount Carmel. With approval of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, an observer was deployed to the scene on March 21, 1993, accompanied by three other operators also characterized as observers. One particular uh, soldier was questioned uh, by a member of the hearing and pressed and pressed. He did not want to reveal even the existence of Delta Force and finally had to admit that they were present. Originally I was told that there was just going to be one or two Delta personnel there as observers, but during the briefing it was mentioned that there was over 10 Delta operators 
at Waco, Texas, and they were not there merely as observers, but would be participating in any type of operational or tactical effort against the Branch Davidians. According Hold it right there, please. Delta Force is, or a combat applications group, is designed for a specific purpose, and that's to protect U.S. interests overseas. For those of you who don't know, there is a law on the federal statutes put there in 1878 by the Congress of the United States prohibiting United States military forces from involving itself in civil law enforcement matters. There's a few exceptions relative to the issue of the war on drugs, but this wasn't the war on drugs. And so for Delta Force to be there, now remember I told you to look for two things. Who can tell me what you were supposed to look for? The, the issue of the gear on the back of the man facing with his back to us. What was that? Yeah, that was a, a, a miniaturized Scott Air Pack. And those fellows had them on, and they were actively pursuing individuals in and around the building. Um, do you think that's an indication of premeditation? They knew there was going to be a fire? Because otherwise, all they would have needed was gas masks to deal with the CS gas. They didn't need an oxygen supply unless the atmosphere became hostile. There's some other bottles on the backs of some other individuals that we didn't see tonight that were not oxygen bottles. Uh, they were one-man ISPRA CS gas dispersion units. And uh, I had some passing familiarity with these in Vietnam. Uh, they were used. Uh, basically to uh, chase Viet Cong individuals out of tunnels uh, by pumping in CS gas. And uh, the, the boys that I worked with found secondary use for them. They were very handy when it came to, uh, it, you know, traditionally after you've taken the village, you burn it. And uh, there's the ever-present pictures of Zippo lighters. The pictures you didn't see was the use of these ISPRA gas sprayers spraying the atomized CS, you can hold a Zippo lighter in front of it like you do with a can of hairspray. Oh, it makes a dandy torch. Puts out a flame about uh, three or four meters long. And uh, gives you a little reach. That way you don't have to be standing next to the hooch when you set it on fire. Uh, that's Vietnamese hut. Um, and there were some of these devices being worn also. So there seems to be a lot of questions raised by some of the material that we found. But there's a few answers, too. Uh, we now know that three of the alleged Delta Force team members have been deposed, and one of them has been polygraphed. OK? Uh, yeah, the response didn't develop any new answers. It seems he was telling the truth. There's a small problem. Uh, there's a, let's see, special escape SEER training. Anybody ever heard of it? There you go. You familiar with it? You ever undergone it? They teach you anything about uh, interrogation techniques? Got the experience. Yeah. Uh, my understanding is, is that we'll include, uh, these are usually reserved for pilots that are going to go over enemy territory and special unit training like Delta Force. Uh, I had to bring this to the attention of our respectable Mr. Danforth. Uh, he wasn't aware of it, but there's actually training that teaches them how to evade polygraph tests and, uh, and torture. My understanding is, is uh, one of the techniques developed by the Vietnamese is they take a water hose and put it down your throat and fill you up to the point to where they'll rupture your bladder, your stomach. Okay, That's a unique experience. And they use this training, literally, with these personnel that go through Sears training. Now, that's the report I've gotten. If you've been through it, you probably know what they do. But it's also supposed to be classified, isn't it? The training techniques? Uh, there are aspects of the training that are classified. Yeah. I'm going to take questions in a minute. So. Well, that's a, an interesting piece of information, but I think the, the key is that 
Uh, you're dealing with some people that are probably some of the best trained individuals in the United States military for dealing with the concepts of interrogation. I don't think Danforth was torturing them. Uh, you know, you, you, it's, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be cute and imply anything. I'm simply saying that you have to ask the questions that say, was this individual capable of lying successfully on a polygraph? And polygraphs are not the best things in the world to make judgments by. Uh, they're not allowed in court as, in federal court as testimony anymore. So the newspapers trumpeting the fact that the Delta Force operator took the test and passed about the question about shooting into the back of the building is not one that's comforting to me, nor is it very credible because of the nature of these people's training. I don't know what the answers are, but I sure have a lot of questions. So that's the kind of thing that goes on. This last segment uh, is a little touchy. Uh, if you have a weak stomach, you should probably not watch. Uh, you're going to see what an explosive device does to a nine-month pregnant woman. Uh, uh, shape charge. And it's not pretty. But how the shape charge got there and what, it was, what that's all about is important. So we're going to show it to you. Want to roll tape? According to their autopsy reports, some of the children were still alive during the fire. But based upon the condition of their bodies, there was evidence of a deadly explosion. I read uh, that the FBI, on foot, entered the building, shot the Davidians, and planted an explosive device on top of the church vault that he called it. We referred to it as the bunker because it's a uh, concrete cinder block. Um, that's another theory that did not, could not have possibly happened uh, in this, this particular incident, uh, referring to that explosion. The explosion happened well after the building was totally destroyed. Um, it, was, it was very unlikely that, uh, that that explosion was anything other than a propane cylinder. The fireball was created by a ruptured propane tank on the ground adjacent to the bunker. But a large hole in the roof of the bunker has never had an official acknowledgement or explanation. What it tells me is that you had a demolition charge went off on the roof. General Ben Parton, a former military explosive expert, testified that there were two explosions. This footage shows the detonation of a high explosive device on the bunker, which appears to ignite gas from a ruptured propane tank. The, uh, the blast hole at the top of the roof, uh, you can plainly see the rebar is bent in. The damage to the stainless steel uh, refrigerator, which uh, appears to have been under the blast hole, is consistent with, with a shape charge and the blast being directed downward into the room in this enclosed concrete room would very likely uh, cause some seam rupture and uh, create a, a huge overpressure inside the room that would uh, pretty much kill everybody in there. To anybody who was under uh, this device when it, was, uh, when it was blown would have been horribly mangled, uh, probably dismembered, pretty much like being thrown into a, uh, a grain thresher. Having uh, examined still photographs and videotapes of the bunker, it was apparent to me that this was caused by a shape charge. But what bothers me is who would have the audacity to use such a charge? Uh, rather than risk your own people going in there and trying to shoot it out with them, uh, it's a standard. It's a standard tactic in uh, city fighting, in military operations that built up terrain, uh, to use explosives in this manner to uh, kill people in the targeted room that you're going to attack. The military's advice to the FBI was that it should focus on the leadership and capture or kill David Koresh. Okay, your turn. Who would like to ask some questions? The microphone is back there. You'll need to go to the microphone. If you want to ask questions, please go to the back. Well, hello. 
Hi. Um, well, I, the question I have basically is what is your conception of conspiracy? If we all can continue to, <clears throat> one of the problems I have here tonight, I'm new, okay, but I share your sentiments about tyranny in, in America, okay? I, I think that we're really living in a very tyrannical state. And, but when, when it comes to the question of what is, how do you define, uh, how do you define a conspiracy, okay? If we do not, good Americans, real Americans, don't get together and do something serious about this, then we are conspirators in, in the worst sense of the word, I think. That's, that's why I'm here tonight. But I don't, I, I appreciate that the film in the sense that uh, it, I'm not an expert on Wa uh, Waco. Uh, it gave me a lot of specifics. I think I'll get the tape if I can. But uh, Speak up, it's, to me, it's not the issue is not so much it, did it happen or is it based on a tyrannical government that it did happen. But it's what are we going to do about it. It's more, I'm more concerned about that. I hope in future sessions that I can learn more about that. I'm more concerned about that. Well, first, you have to know what happened to the degree that the knowledge you have is meaningful. Okay? Having well, bits and pieces okay. that... Let me if I may, okay, I, I, maybe I, I wanted to just make a statement as well as a question, but what I'm thinking is, is that if you combine uh, Second Amendment rights problems in America, okay, which I frankly, <laughs> the right to bear arms means just that, simply as that. Mm -hmm. you know, California is actually simply not abiding by the Second Amendment. What are we going to do about it? Um, I walk out of here and I can't protect myself. It's, it's absurd. Uh, those, you know, that the drug war is a very bad, is an evil thing. Okay, I, I'm not advocating taking drugs. Frankly, most of the crap is okay. poison. I, I need a question. Do you have okay, one? question is, and I give this to the group: What in the hell we're going to do about this? And uh, that's something that probably won't be decided here tonight. And probably okay, will, that's okay. That's I just want to be associated with that question. That's all. We can. It's this is like preaching to the to the choir. We. I think in well, you're, you're asking a rhetorical question. It deserves an answer. But right. my contention is, is that each of the individual people that are here tonight and yourself are going to have to think about it long and hard. Okay. The, the founding fathers came up with a solution and, an, and, a, and a plan of action reluctantly. It took them a great deal of time. Read the statement at the I beginning do of the agree. Declaration of Independence. I do. A I long agree. string of usurpations. The Declaration of Independence is a currently contemporaneous revolutionary tract. Okay? I'll tell you this. I just want to offer one other thing to the group. I would recommend, it's a rather uh, a ponderous bit of uh, thinking and uh, writing, but I would recommend that people get into reading John Stuart Mill's essay on liberty. And uh, look at it as a as a theoretical framework to look at, it was written in 1859, the same year that uh, Darwin's famous essay was written. Okay. And I look at it as um, a... Sir, I, I'm going to have to ask you. You, okay. you stated okay. your question, Just okay? Do, uh, th thank you very much for the time. Okay, thank you. I would like to ask if you have seen a special put out by the uh, History Channel. It came out maybe a month or so ago. Uh, it was on cults. And at the end of the video, they dealt with the Branch uh, Davidians, and they sh part of it was showing the assault on the compound. Now, as clear as day, one of them that lasts several seconds, you see two ATF agents firing rounds. One of them had a, a, a pistol, and the other one had an automatic rifle into the compound. I mean, you could see the recoil as plain as day. Mm -hmm. Now, with a, <laughs> with a clip like that, why would we need to bother with these infrared uh, analyses? Well, the footage you're talking about occurred on February 28th, not April the 19th. The footage that you're talking about is the shots of the ATF agents firing at the building on February the 28th. This infrared material is on April the 19th, the day of the fire. That's why they fired on both days, February 28th and April the 19th. You understand? I see. Okay. So yeah. it is significant because they say they didn't fire a single shot on April the 19th. I mean, yeah. Okay, so that's why the infrared is significant. The yeah. shot you're referring to of the ATF agents firing into the building occurred on February 28th. Well, they don't deny that then. I see. Yeah, my question uh, refers to the ATF raid. 
um, the ATF claims that the Branch Davidians fired a large amount of ammunition. Do you know what that, what the number of rounds they allege the Branch Davidians to have fired was? Um, several thousand. Uh, I th the uh, issue of who shot first is always the popular question. My, my question doesn't go to who shot first. Has the ATF ever uh, demonstrated any bullet holes in any of their vehicles or trailers that they rolled up there? Because I think that the number that I heard the ATF claim was that it was in excess of 25,000 rounds were fired upon them and, tw and uh, just 1,000 rounds fired and a small percentage of those landing on a vehicle will turn a vehicle into metallic Swiss cheese. And I've never seen or heard of any evidence that they have that there was a single bullet hole in any of the vehicles that they were standing next to as the ATF was firing into a building occupied by innocent people, which is a felony crime. Firing into a building in the state of Texas is a felony. Right. If well, they were engaging a target that was act, act, actively firing at them, yep. then uh, that would be a reason to return fire. And your question, sir? My, my question is, has there been any display of any of those vehicles that they claim were in the line of fire of uh, rounds being fired out of the Branch Davidian property toward their positions? Yes, dozens of still photographs and hours of videotape. And indeed, those vehicles were pretty chewed up, not as much as one would think. But yes, there's strong evidence, absolute evidence, of a number of bullet holes in a number of the vehicles. And uh, I also have the, the morgue pictures of the ATF agents that died. Uh, the question of was there really a gunfight on February 28th that went both ways, yes, there was. Um, and the Branch Davidians, in the new film, we show you our belief, our understanding of the evidence as to how the gunfight got started. As I like to say, we basically had two cults facing off with one another. The Branch Davidians on one side and the ATF cult on the other side. And the difficulty was is that uh, they were, uh, the, the ATF walked into it thinking, well, you know, we're gonna come in there with this overwhelming show of force and they're going to fall down on the ground shaking and, and fearful and just give up and, you know, don't hurt me, don't hurt me. Branch Davidians didn't see it that way. And the net result was is that the initial assault team that had to go to the door was led by two agents with fire extinguishers, CO2 fire extinguishers. Their job was to drive off the five Malamute dogs that stayed in a little enclosed area around the front porch. And uh, <laughs> dogs didn't give up either. And they wound up having to shoot them. And those were the first shots fired. And once those first shots were fired, with all those people standing around with adrenaline pumping with guns in their hands, the doo-doo hit the fan. And the rest is history. When did the shots uh, fired from the helicopters? That would have been after the initial gunfight started on the ground. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to use some additional footage that we acquired of gunfire from the helicopters on February 28th because there was a conflict with the first film and the first film's producers. But that information has been passed along. Uh, briefly, it it's, uh, seems there was seven or eight video cameras in operation inside the Black Hawk helicopter as it approached the back of the building. We got a hold of two of the videotapes. And they're rather interesting because the soundtrack on both of them at a certain point as the helicopter gets within gun range of the, uh, the building in the visuals that we're looking at, you start hearing these pop, 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 pop sounds. Well, that weren't firecrackers, folks. And uh, what's fascinating is we found another piece of footage that basically uh, was shot by a gentleman uh, from the T intersection, uh, a TV camera operator simultaneous with the footage that was being filmed from inside the helicopter. And as the Blackhawks flew over his head, and as they approach, you can hear the gunfire start before the gunfire, before the helicopter arrives at the scene. And that gunfire is coming from the ground, from near the front doors. And lo and behold, 
if you take the audio pattern of the gunfire from the ground camera and compare it with the two audio tracks from inside the helicopter, guess what? They don't match. It's real simple. You run it through an oscilloscope, it prints out a dot for each pop, and you look at the pattern on the scale, and you overlay it with the pattern from the sounds from the ground, and they don't match. So what does that mean? That means the gunfire being heard inside the helicopter did not come from the ground, which anyone who's ever been in a Huey can tell you when people are shooting at you from the ground, if you're more than 100 feet off the ground or more, you're not going to hear the small arms fire inside the helicopter. And so the oscilloscope measurements confirm that, that the helicopter gunfire we hear from inside the helicopter is coming from inside the helicopter. It's semi-automatic. And it approximates the sound of what a 9 millimeter sounds like when it's going off. You know, like a, a SIG sidearm or maybe an MP5 and semi-automatic. There were a number of Branch Davidians that were killed by 9 millimeter rounds that came through the ceiling, <coughs> top of the head. So Mr. Danforth has confiscated all the government's firearms. He's running ballistics tests. And he's going to match those bullets with the bullets that killed the Branch Davidians, that gunfire coming through the roof, and those guns belong to the guys in the helicopters, I'll bet you. How, how many uh, rounds total does the ATF admit to having fired into the compound? They've never given a specific figure, uh, but what's interesting is, is the fact that they did run out of ammunition during the course of events. Most of the agents ran out of ammunition. Uh, that's a problem because people are still shooting at you. And, uh, and you know, it's really amazing. There's some footage in the film that, that you have to pay close attention to. Uh, there was a ceasefire called, and here's all these agents standing up from their hiding places in plain view from the building, and they all walk away. Now, if the Branch Davidians were truly bent upon killing all the ATF agents, what a beautiful opportunity to whack them all. But they didn't do it. Yeah. There were extensive uh, portions of film that I've seen mm -hmm. where the agents are standing clear of their vehicles and they're firing into the building mm -hmm. and they're not taking cover behind any of those vehicles while they're doing so and there's no evidence of the ground being churned up by right. uh, return fire or any other evidence that uh, bullets are flying in their direction. Well, there's a lot of important information contained in a lot of footage and a lot of photos that simply haven't been looked at the way they should, and hopefully that will change. Uh, I think the issue of who fired first, in my mind, is pretty clear. The first victims of gunfire at Mount Carmel were the six Malamute dogs. Uh, the next victims, as the, the shots continued to ring out, the next human victims, one of the first ones was David Koresh ducking back inside the door, uh, and then some of the other Branch Davidians, and some ATF agents. And, you know, it's beyond me to tell you which bullet struck which person first in the time sequence as to all of these events. I don't know if that will ever be straightened out. One, one final question. Um, what was the total amount of uh, CS powder pumped into uh, the building? Depending buildings? on who you, who you want to believe, uh, the agents that handled the powder uh, and the military personnel that loaded it, or the official statements by the FBI during the congressional hearings, or the estimates by the experts who came in and tried to backlog it and figure it out, somewhere in the vicinity of seven or eight pounds of actual powder with something like 28 or 30 gallons of methylene chloride. Um, folks, uh, how many of you have been in the military and gone through the CS gas chamber? Was it fun? No. Was the one thing you wanted to do was get the hell out of that place? Yeah. Okay. Uh, could you imagine sitting inside that chamber for six hours yeah, with without training. a gas mask? In, in military training, the amount that's used in uh, quite a large enclosure is the size of a quarter of a tablet of aspirin. Yeah. Okay. And now we're he talking about Heated up on pounds. a little sterno stove. Yeah. And uh, the, the next issue becomes one of, he ain't done yet, go ahead. Well, I, I really appreciate the work that you've done here, Thank you. as do a lot of other vets that don't want to see the U.S. military misused in all of the myriad and diabolical ways that it's being misused right now. I appreciate that too.
Yes, sir. Done. I'd like to say I enjoy your previous video, but it's not very enjoyable to watch, and I haven't had actually even been able to get through it because I get sick. Mm -hmm. I actually get a, a, a blood pressure rush with my ears. I get so upset. So I'm a little confused on some things that may be plain to you. One of the things I'm confused on is a um, part of an article written by James Pate for Soldier of Fortune magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I understand he attended the uh, Davidian trial. And what I don't understand is the confusion among the jurors and their partial acquittal on some of the counts, I guess, of some of the defendants, which caused the judge to reverse their not guilty uh, decision. That just boggles my mind. And maybe, like I said, I, I can't even read this stuff with a, with a clear head sometimes. Yeah. So maybe you can fill me in on that. And also, were there empty shell casings recovered um, out external to the building? We see guys apparently firing machine guns at the building. There should, should have been 9 millimeter casings all over the ground, which probably could not have come from the Davidians inside, one would think. Thanks. Okay. Um, first of all, the new film addresses the issue about the jury. Uh, the jury foreperson, Sarah Bain, uh, gives us an interview and tries to explain what happened uh, with the jury finding the Branch Davidians not guilty of uh, homicide and conspiracy to commit homicide of a federal agent, acquitting them. And uh, the, the flip side of that coin, where they found the, did find them guilty of involuntary manslaughter, whereas they were acting in self-defense but still had responsibility. Uh, the other issue of uh, shell casings is also addressed in the new film, only uh, the shell casings aren't 9 millimeter. They're not from February 28th, but they're rather uh, from the shooting incident of April the 19th. Uh, these shell casings are found at one of the sniper positions, Sierra 1 which was occupied by a gentleman all familiar to most of us, a gentleman by the name of Lon Horiuchi, who signed an FBI 302 report saying that he had not fired, nor had any of his personnel, fired a single shot at the Branch Davidians. There's also an FBI 302 report from uh, an agent, uh, Riley, who claims to have heard gunfire emanating from Sierra One in mid-morning of the 19th. So it's interesting to note that Mr. Horiuchi, at this point, as of today, may be joined as the currently only single individual named and left standing in the civil litigation suit. So he has to defend in that civil litigation case. However, that may change now because of some events that occurred today by virtue of the demolition of the building and the responsibility of Dick Rogers and uh, Jeff Jamar. Mr. Shulman. Mike, when we started this investigation, we both had an incredulity at the idea that that the government would uh, would actually deliberately go in there to try to kill the Branch Davidians, True. and that's and that's what motivated our looking at the Linda Thompson matter uh, mm -hmm. to start off with. When when I thought it was the FBI in charge of Waco on April 19th, it made sense to me that federal agents might want to kill the Branch Davidians as sort of a preemptive punishment for the deaths of the ATF agents. It made sense to me that federal agents might want to send a message, uh, you kill federal agents and you die. When we now learn that, uh, that military operatives possibly were, were, were firing into the building, uh, firing uh, canisters in the building, uh, possibly operating the tanks, it puts a whole new tenor on it. Suddenly, suddenly uh, C and C is, 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 is elsewhere. And so, I mean, I'm wondering, are we looking now at an American me lie? were basically simply the tactics involved, the training involved of these guys. They were trained to, to, to operate in anti-terrorist situations, and they simply applied tactics which should not have been used domestically, and posse comitatus was designed. Or, are we, or is your trail leading back to the White House for a strategic objective that we haven't even started to uncover yet? <laughs> now you know. Now you know why Neil and I did what we did. Uh, the short answer is, I can't tell you yet. And you can't know yet. And you know more of this evidence than anybody. Well, I hope not. But the point is, we don't know yet because there hasn't been sufficient or successful 
interrogation of the individuals who actually participated. And, you know, I'm not going to sit here and second guess these guys. I don't know if there was any legitimate rationale for what they did or what appears that they did. Okay? We've got some pretty strong evidence here, folks, that what they did was not exactly what you'd want them to do. But the point is, you'll notice in the film when you watch it, I, I don't label these guys as murderers. Remember Linda? Remember what she said in the flamethrower tank? You know, this proves beyond a reasonable doubt. They murdered the branch of idiots. No, I don't know. I don't know if it's murder. I don't know if it's negligent homicide. I don't know if it's manslaughter. I don't know if it's second degree murder or first degree murder. Those are very sophisticated legal terms that have to be determined through <coughs> something that the Branch Davidians never received. Due process. Do we know where the buck stops? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd say that the buck, there's enough buck to go around for just about all the major <coughs> players. Webb Hubble, Janet Reno, uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton, <coughs> William Jefferson Clinton, uh, about the only one I didn't see there was Al Gore and Juice, O.J. Simpson. Although, it's been pointed out to me that there is an individual running around the building at high speed as it burns down, <coughs> yelling, Go Avis! But I don't know. Thank you, Mike. I have two quick questions. One, where's the magic steel door? Did you uncover that? And number two, is there documentation showing that every congressman and senator have had access or have this tape that anybody on the room or anybody in the countryside could ask them about what's on this tape or any other evidence that might be brought forth that they can be challenged publicly rather than sitting around here rumbling between ourselves? Good question. Last question first. Congressmen are receiving their copies this coming week. A bunch of them. Not all of them, but... <laughs> Uh, Senator Schumer? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Hillary and Bill and Janet. Louie. Uh, most of the members that were sitting on the 1995 House Committee that did the investigation. Um, Mr. Tom Lantos? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Is there um, any way that we could find out who they are so we can challenge them? I mean, sure, if somebody in this room has the Say, opportunity. Hey, did you get your copy of the tape yet? <laughs> Yo, dude. Did you I get your copy of the tape yet? No, and you the asked him. Have, is, have, you know, have you received it? But then make sure that they do. If, if they oh. signed for it, registered, or whatever. Gee. You know. They can't hide them. They the can't papers. hide if it's a public. Well, you both pin their ears back a, for me, would you? I, a, I, I'm, a, I'm busy. Come on. <laughs> That's your job, citizen. I have to know if he's received it because they always haven't. I haven't seen that. I'm sorry, I can't address the answer. Okay. The answer How do I the know that they the received question, it? The answer to the question is that all the still sitting members of the House uh, Judiciary Committee that heard the hearings in 1995 have had tapes sent to them. As to whether their staffs threw them away, gave them to them, watched them, and gave them a brief synopsis, I have no idea. But the point is they were sent, and we know they were received. Uh, we also did a pre-screening of the film uh, in July of 1999. And a number of congressmen saw it. Dan Burton saw it. That's why he's so ticked off. Okay? That's why he's conducting hearings. A number of congressmen saw it. Uh, we showed it to some Democrats, too. <laughs> and one of them fell asleep, and the other one just sat there and turned sort of purple-red. So draw your own conclusion. The first question you asked, again, was? The door. The door. The door. Okay, no. The right-hand door is still missing. The left-hand door I have examined personally, closely, and carefully. And it has a lot of bullet holes in it, not as many as the right-hand door. And ladies and gentlemen, the preponderance of bullet holes are coming from the inside. I'm sorry, from the outside going in. But there are a number of bullet holes coming from the inside going out. So what does that tell you? I was going to ask about the door, too, and the only question I'd have left is what excuse do they give for any missing evidence, such as the door? Or the government, that is. Oh, come on. <laughs> you know, come on. On the, on the record. On what the are you record. talking about? They're the government. They don't have to put anything on the record, and they didn't. Yeah? Okay. The only thing in the record about the door is that uh, it was apparently destroyed in the fire, and that's about as good as you get in the Justice Department report. It's about that long. Sure, it was melted. Now, what's funny is, is 
the photos of the building as it's burning clearly show both doors laying at an angle to the interior, laying on rubble. Both of them. But, gosh, one of them survived and one didn't. I wonder why. Okay, I, People, you put too much store in the doors. All right, They're not going to tell you who shot first. They're not going to tell you if somebody shot from inside to the outside and outside to the inside because they did both. The Davidians fired back through the doors and the ATF shot through the doors and neither one of them could see what was on the other side of those doors. They did it. Did the Branch Davidians convert weapons? Yes, they did. The only thing we don't know is did they convert them before February 28th or during the siege? And the government can't answer that question either. There's a lot of things. Look, the Branch Davidians weren't saints, okay? But you do have to understand what they were doing was converting weapons because they felt they would need them in this kind of confrontation. And they weren't selling them to other people. And the crime they committed, according to Bill Johnston, in, in a question that I asked him about a month and a half ago was, Bill, and by the way, there will be more information come out about the February 28th raid having not gone the way that it had been approved by the federal magistrate and the U.S. attorney. Surprise, surprise. Uh, Mr. Koresh was supposed to have been arrested in town. And a quiet phone call made by him back to the Branch Davidians saying, have these folks come in and, and, you know, pick up the guns they need. There was only two people named on the warrant, Paul Fatta and David Koresh. Okay? Guess what? There was 145 people in that building that day. That means there was 143 innocent bystanders. Think about it. So the bottom line becomes one of, were the Branch Davidians violating the law relative to the illegal manufacture of machine guns? Probably. What was the potential penalty for said conviction? Had it gone down the way it was supposed to have gone down relative to the issue of an appropriate capture, retention, prosecution, and if there was a conviction, what would David Koresh have received? Bill Johnston said, well, there's federal sentencing guidelines, but considering he's never been convicted of a crime before that, he probably would have gotten probation. Okay. Probation, folks. But instead of probation, we've got almost 100 men, women, and children, four dead ATF agents, all killed. Probation? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, um, one of my questions was about the door. And my other question is, um, have you heard anything about the um, fire department being called prior to the fire being set? I, I was always curious about that. Fire department called the FBI and asked if they wanted them to preposition their vehicles. The FBI said nope. Uh, then smoke was seen by the fire department and they called the FBI and said, do you want us to come in now? Nope. Uh, what most people don't know is, is there was a company in Czechoslovakia called Flame Check. Catchy little name. These guys were weird. They took, uh, what is it, T-74 Russian Soviet tanks. And they put these big, huge tanks, container tanks, on top of them. And their famous East German water cannons. And a foam processor. And the whole thing was robotic. I've got the videotape. It's a fantastic machine. It's robotic. There's nobody in it. And this sucker can put out a fire five seconds flat. Okay? A good sized fire. And the tape shows the thing rolling over all kinds of mountainous terrain and everything. And it's all robotic. It's handled from, you know, a couple miles away. And this company offered the FBI the use of these vehicles in the standoff during the siege. And the FBI said, nope. Gosh. That would have solved their problem with worrying about firemen being injured and shot. Another question? No, that's it. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Have you given serious thought to following the major presidential candidates this year, you know, McCain, Bush, and so forth, and demanding of them that they make an accounting should they be elected? of what this administration obviously is not going to do, which is the truth of what happened in Waco. Well, I'll tell you what, if you folks don't send at least one copy to each of those presidential candidates, I'm going to be really disappointed. I would like to see this become a presidential issue. The issue is very simple. Matter of fact, if some of you would like a, a bright, 
shining idea. Here's one for you. Someone should organize a posse comitatus pledge. Write it very carefully. Contact David Hardy. He's drafted one. We need some spark plugs. And the posse comitatus pledge, you go to each presidential candidate and ask them to sign it. And they swear and affirm that if elected president of the United States, they will not use military forces on the citizens of the United States. <laughs> then go ask them to sign it. Uh, I already know Orrin Hatch wouldn't sign it, but you know he's out of the race now, so that doesn't count. I wonder if Mr. McCain and Mr. Gore and, and Mr. Bush and the rest of them would or wouldn't. I think it would be a very interesting test. And then along with the Posse Comitatus Pledge, you could circulate petitions that the Posse Comitatus Statute be observed by every president and see how many signatures you can get. Maybe that might yield. I see there's on the internet there's a, uh, a Waco walk that's designed for pledges, et cetera, of various sorts, not the least of which is to help the Branch Davidians rebuild their chapel. And if you go to the website of rebuildthechurch.com, you can see the fact that they are rebuilding the chapel, and it's, it's up. Uh, they're doing finish work now, and they need still, still need some help. So you can contact them, and if you feel, excuse me, so inclined, uh, you can send them a couple of bucks for a memorial pane of glass in one of the windows or something of that nature. So there's a number of things. I was asked that earlier in the, in the program tonight. What can we do? Well, gee, you could uh, circulate the Posse Comitatus Pledge amongst the presidential candidates and make a big hullabaloo out of it. And, uh, and a posse comitatus uh, petition, uh, having people sign to plead with the federal government not to use federal troops against American civilians. Um, there's all these things, okay? Um, the one thing that you don't want to do is go out and blow up buildings, not, not at this point in time and not probably ever. But the point is, if you don't do these things, then these folks, w they're pushing. They're pushing from their direction. They're pushing in a way to where they want their will obeyed. And you have the responsibility to resist peacefully and appropriately. If you don't, then we can look forward to photographs and videotape of very famous images of young children, your young children, running down a street with their clothes on fire from being napalmed. Do you want that? Don't go there. So get out there and do the kinds of things that I've suggested tonight. Get the film, watch it, get proactive, do these things. Don't think that writing your congressman is not going to get anything done. Writing him may not, but if you show up on his doorstep with an appropriate appointment and sit down and ask him to watch a couple of minutes of the film, pick out the juiciest parts, the ones that are most exemplary, like the FLIR, and say, look, you may not be on a committee that's hearing this, but you know what? that doesn't keep you from initiating resolutions to take action to prevent this thing from happening in the future or passing bills, boarding up, supporting up the Posse Comitatus Act. Don't let it happen again. And if he does those things, then you support him or her. Help him get reelected. And if they don't do that, work for his removal from office. Otherwise, all you got left is Napalm. Yes, sir. Uh, I have two questions. Did you imply that uh, Vince Foster was at the, uh, more or less, the top of the command chain uh, for this Waco thing, perhaps under Hillary's direction? No, I didn't imply it. <laughs> I see. Well, did you also run into any evidence that Vince Foster may have been involved in other terminal incidents uh, requested by Hillary? You mean that list of dead bodies that follows Bill Clinton around? Yes. <laughs> what a concept. <laughs> what a country. Um, no. Uh, all I can tell you is, is that what we did look at had to do with documents that Mr. Foster had generated, documents that disappeared and went into the hands of the First Lady, and that's where we leave it. Okay. You can take it further if you want. I read that three or four members of the Delta Force died in training accidents last year. Just coincidence? Do you believe everything you read? I have no idea. I have no idea if these men were actually members of Delta Force. You know, the, you have to understand something about Delta Force that isn't Delta Force. 
Uh, first of all, the things that they do are very dangerous, and the training they do is exceedingly dangerous. And people die in training on a regular basis. If they were members of Delta Force and they died in a training accident, you had a, an officer and an enlisted man who got caught on a pull-through, this is a rope that's used for rescue efforts, uh, between two barges, and the barges came together and there was nowhere to come up for air. I don't see anything insidious about that. What I think is, is that, <laughs> oh, this internet, internet stuff gets you, gets you crazy sometimes, and it's, it's difficult to say one way or the other. I think what's more interesting is, is you ought to take a look at the names of the individuals, where and when you can find them, who were involved in the attempt to capture the warlord in Somalia in October of 1993, because many of them were Delta Force members. The question is, how many of them, and we may find that out this year, how many of them were actively participating in the Waco affair? And why was it that I, when I talk to military personnel involved in that operation, they're very bitter about Mr. Clinton's pulling of requests for armor to rescue those guys. So that is worthy of further pursuit. And that was the majority of the Delta Force guys, in all probability, that were involved in the operation at Waco. And 18 of them died. Not all of them Delta Force, but a number of them were. And I can't tell you because, you see, we can't get their names to verify. Yes, ma'am. Mike, uh, <laughs> to get some perspective on this, um, I would like you to recount the situation that brought the BATF to Waco and David Koresh in the first place. What was their motivation? Well, it goes like this. January 1992, the BATF had a problem, and that problem centered on the fact that there was a, a number of issues that had come up. One was the uh, complaints filed by certain female BATF agents on sexual harassment with the full knowledge, support, and cooperation of leadership individuals in the BATF. Uh, that one wound up on 60 Minutes. In addition to that, a number of black ATF agents filed discrimination suits regarding employment. Uh, the BATF also had a problem because Ronald Reagan wanted to disband them and roll their duties into the FBI's operation, which happened uh, like a couple years before. The Congress of the United States was very unhappy with the BATF and wanted to reduce their budget. Their budget hearings were scheduled for March the 10th, 1993. The raid took place on February 28, 1993. Those budget cut considerations directly focused on the very raid teams that did the raid at Waco. And they were about to be cut. Well, it becomes very clear that they had a publicity problem. They did have an opportunity, or what they saw was an opportunity, with the election of William Jefferson Clinton in November of 1992, which coincides exactly with the time that the investigation of the Branch Davidians was taken off the shelf, dusted off, and resurrected because it had failed and hadn't gone anywhere up until that time. So to me, it's clear that the BATF decided to focus on the Branch Davidians because they were an easy target. They weren't somebody that you were going to be all concerned about when you heard about them the first time. And with a little demonization, a little twist here, a little adjustment there, something that Mr. Goebbels would be proud of, we could probably dismiss these individuals as just a bunch of wackos in Waco and uh, get on with our successful raid and we'll have all this wonderful video of all these people laying on the ground, uh, spread eagle with their hands out in front of them. and all these horrible assault weapons spread out on the ground on these blankets of all these crazy people that we captured and all the little children looking like waifs and boy could we have fun with that. Thank you. I just wanted to get that on the record and on this tape. I appreciate it. Thank you for a great presentation too. Thank you. I think that means everybody wants to go home, right? One more question. This is the last one. What you need? Uh, just a short remark uh, regarding the rangers in Somalia they were forced to go seven different times using the same technique where they heard General Adid was whispered to have been the first thing they teach you in ranger school is never attack a target two times the same way they were required to go the same way with CNN filming it and broadcasting it to General Adid, who went to the United States Army Infantry School at Fort Benning, Georgia, and learned how to, how to set an ambush. So 
that they were forced to go into what was a certain ambush and McCain was one of the people that got a letter saying why are these people the the unit the target why is all that all of that information been disseminated because now General Adid knows how to lay a trap for him Okay, get your uh, your red tickets.